don't know about that. I can handle two. Yeah, <laughs> Gorge again. All right. So let's get going here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's November 1st. Um, the Eagle Roundtable is on. We are just flying solo today. We have a lot to talk about. But before we get going, let's talk. Let's allow our own John Sibley Butler to play some music. Maybe I didn't love you. Quite as often as I should have. And maybe I did treat you quite as good as I could have. But if I made you feel second best, girl, I'm sorry I was blind. But you were always on my mind. You're always on my mind. All right. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Do you think Thank you're you, going to play for the next hour? Yes, sir. It's called Talent. T A L E N T. <laughs> John Butler, how are you? How are you today? You seem to be sniffling. Uh, uh, what's going on? I am absolutely fine. I love the weather. The weather is, is is really really nice. I hate the news. The news is really really bad. I think that we are we are at war uh, theoretically. I don't like what's going on college campuses. I don't like what's going on in in uh, in the Middle East. But not liking something is, is is as we would say, you have to embrace what comes and then essentially solve the problem. And of course, you know, we've got lots of stuff going on in the political arena. We have lots of lawsuits going back and forth. And it's not so much that so much is happening, is that we understand and see everything that's happening now. So if you have a cell phone, which everybody does, then the news automatically pops up. By the time I get to the nightly news, I'll, I've already read all of the stories that's on uh, the nightly news. But the big issue, I think, would be the economy in the future. If you look at what we're looking forward to, it's like people are very, very fearful. They're fearful that jobs will disappear. If you look at the disruptions in America, I think that they will increase as jobs begin to uh, disappear, especially for, for the middle and, and, and upper classes. And then of course we have the political election that's all winding uh, winding up. I've been I've been very, very busy because uh, Mike Johnson is a LSU guy. He just got, he's gonna have the gavel up in the, uh, the head man up there with the gavel. Uh, and uh, he's an LSU guy, he's from Freeport, Louisiana very religious guy, uh, very, very uh, constructive in terms of he wants to do. Uh, people look at him as a conservative uh, because of the social issue. He does have the uh, the resurrection. <laughs> I call it a resurrection. He does have the riot, if you will, that's uh, holding over his head where he said he would defend Trump. But overall, overall, he's a good uh, kind of LSU tiger and had another friend who just got elected to the governor of Louisiana. Jeff Landry. So I've been I've been very very uh, busy in a lot of ways. So, Andreas, like we always say here, um, it's a lot going on, and whatever they do, even if they want electric tanks, they're going to have to plug them in. Even if they want electric airplanes, they want to plug them in. <laughs> so there's a lot going on, and of course, AI that was uh, given to us by our distinguished, distinguished Llewellyn King, he warned us months ago that this would be the major topic. And of course, you just said, well, it's not AI, it's machine learning. So we have to make sure that we define our terms as we move along. But it's good to see everybody. It's good to see you, uh, Llewellyn King, and it's good to see you, Andreas. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Llewellyn, you. how are you, sir? Well, we are in a very troubled world. You know, I follow the columnist George F. Well. I used to know him quite well once, but he has been the sound, solid voice of conservatism. I haven't always agreed with him. I didn't agree with him on term limits and some other thing, 
but mostly I found him a very wise commentator. And he is so down on the current situation politically throughout the country, the paucity of ideas, the shallowness of the people, the lack of imagination, the failure to grasp the dignity of the country, and the pettiness, the endless, atrocious, sickening pettiness that now envelops Washington, particularly the House of Representatives, but the I assure you that the that the Senate is not far behind. Uh, we are in a bad, bad time when we need solid leadership. We need youngish, informed, traveled people with well-stocked minds. And being <clears throat> religious is not a well-stocked mind. It can be an asset, but generally it's not a good thing in politics. The founding fathers were fairly clear about that. And I can't see anything uh, that uh, that was wrong with their view. Uh, we we have a, a very bad situation. We have this small-time, narrow-minded man who is now going to be Speaker of the House of Representatives, largely by default, a defender of a reprehensible president, uh, Donald Trump. And what is going on? We have a war in Ukraine which will spill across Europe if we uh, lose heart or miscalculate it. We have a war in the Middle East, which is dividing us at home. It is uh, a fact that uh, uh, you've got to be very careful that your response does not exceed the initial hurt. There was a very wise commentary by, <clears throat> by Friedman in the New York Times who uh, pointed out that when India was attacked by Pakistan with a uh, terrorist attack on a hotel, uh, akin, not as serious, but akin to what happened to Israel, they were very careful in the response. There was two schools of thinking, one of which is we throw everything at Pakistan, we just go against them, total retribution, or we play it gently we play it more carefully and we, we, we see it doesn't happen again. And we work over a long period of time to bring to justice and to punish the perpetrators. What has happened in the Middle East and uh, Friedman, who has been writing about and lived in Israel and is Jewish, um, said, you know, it, it's an over response and it's unclear what Israel thinks it will achieve. Will it now administer Gaza? 2.2 million people? Will it provide health care? Will it provide a system of government? Will it find a puppet government that it can set up a, a, a sort of satellite of Israel? What is the plan? Uh, you have a deteriorating situation because of this over response. Well, I think it's an over response on the West Bank. I don't know Gaza, but I know the West Bank fairly well. I spent a good deal of time reporting there. Uh, this is a very tragic situation. The initial tragedy was a blow to Israel of un unbelievable proportions. The largest loss of Jewish life since the Holocaust, and one can sympathize absolutely and totally and without reservation about their loss, their hurt, the ungodly, ghastly thing that happened. But we cannot, I cannot totally uh, sympathize with what appears to me to be hugely vindictive retribution, where so many children, so many women, so many innocents are suffering so totally. It is a truly awful situation. Our campuses are divided, our living rooms are divided. Uh, I find division between those who are appalled and those who uh, believe it is justified almost everywhere. We have supported Israel for the longest time, and it's very difficult. I go back a long way and know something about Israel. My first wife, who died recently, a wonderful, brilliant journalist, as informed and wise a woman as you could meet in a day's march. Um, she moved to Israel. She was Jewish, and she lived there for quite a few years because she was English. And among Jewish intellectuals in England at that time, there was a great feeling that the country that would get it right, where human values would be correctly and totally balanced, 
would be Israel. After seven years, she asked me if I could help her get back to England because she couldn't take uh, some of the things that were happening. Uh, Netanyahu, who is himself probably a reprehensible man, may not be the man who should be conducting affairs today. Likewise, we have Ukraine, where we have the innocence of Ukraine that was invaded by Putin, another monster, and no resolution in sight. If we, if members of the House who want to withdraw funding, get this, they want to withdraw funding for Ukraine and up funding for Israel, we will have trouble in Europe. I just came back from Albania. This week I came back. I was at the Association of European Journalists meeting, and there is terror in the small countries that were part of the Soviet Union that if we do not do the right thing in Ukraine, defend it, give it the arms, the money, uh, everything that it needs to hold off the Russian invasion, there will be other invasions. Putin will be emboldened, and he will try to take over as many little countries as he can. Um, he has been threatening the Baltic states for some time now. We know the pattern. You've got some Russians there. You say they were mistreated. Bang, you invade the world. And what is this going to do? We have three huge problems at the moment. War, environment, and suddenly artificial intelligence, all of which threaten life going forward as we have known it. It is not a simple matter of saying the economy is fine, all is well. We may lose hundreds of thousands of jobs in a very short order, a matter of a few years, maybe two or three, it will start happening. Already the fast food joints are beginning to uh, uh, bring in artificial intelligence. We're using it every day. But as I've said on this program previously, Artificial intelligence has huge benefits in research, in medicine. We may live, or children born today, as a friend of mine who is a researcher said, may live to be 120 because of advances through AI in medicine. But my God, the losses in jobs, the disorganization, the capacity to use AI for disinformation by the Chinese, by, these are all whole new frontiers and we don't have the leadership we need to take care of it. Western world is weak in leadership. We have a, a floundering prime minister in England, an unpopular and not particularly talented president in France, and so it goes. Germany is politically its weakest it has been in decades. So it's not a cheerful time, although I must say I had a wonderful trip. <laughs> well, let me let me, let me just uh, piggyback on that, and let's let's think about what's happening around the globe. And what's more interesting to me also is the what we call the globalization can really be seen. Now. I even call it the the disassimilation of America. You know, America America got its greatness from sameness and the assimilation and not diversity. That is, the diverse people assimilated to American values. To the to the to the English language, to English traditions. So actually, the strength of America has always been its sameness from diverse people. Dust uh, the great What I see now is that what happens in the world. Uh, let's just take uh, 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 the Middle East. Let's take what's happening in Israel now. Is that the assimilation model is not exactly working? Uh, that is, you can all of a sudden people who we thought were assimilated and more Americans, then there, there's a an outcry. And now, of course, there's a conflict between two peop people in America identifying with what's going on overseas. If we go back, for example, to, uh, to World War II, the simulation model was in full force. And then, of course, we did have the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, incarceration that people did not trust. Luella, what do you think about this idea that, that Americans, America's becoming more like Europe now. Instead of being a sameness in terms of values, and by that I mean the English language, I mean English institutions, I mean English laws. I mean that when you come to America traditionally, you know, you got rid of the things that were important to you and your country in terms of dress and et cetera, and you became an American. 
Llewellyn, are we to the point now where we'd be more like Europe uh, than America, where we have a cross nation of people and ideas uh, that will tear America apart so therefore there's no more united force called America? Uh, Johnny, I think you're, you're on to something that I don't think you're quite right about Europe. Europe still is very national conscious. Um, the French are very aware they're French, the Germans are their German, the Lithuanians are their Lithuanian, and the Albanians, and where I've just come from, very much aware that they're Albanian. You haven't seen the kind of cross-fertilization that we thought was happening here. You're right about the past, but it wasn't so much that we were homogenized. It was that the Eurocentric, essentially the European culture dominated, and people who could tr trace their their ancestry to Europe uh, uh, ran the country, and they ran it in every sense. They ran it theatrically, they ran it in business, they ran it politically. Uh, you had within that considerable amount of uh, of tension, say, between German immigrants into New York or Italian immigrants. It wasn't all smooth sailing, but everybody became an American after a while and spoke English. And that was a very binding thing. And when America went abroad, those were the people that were thought of. And I remember because I lived, I mean, I came from Africa and I lived in Europe. Uh, Americans were people with brush cuts and uh, plenty of money and a very cheerful view of the world in our attitude to Americans. Um, we didn't take into account the enormous part of America that had no voice, which included African Americans, Chinese Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans. Those groups are now full of voice and have not signed on to the Euro Eurocentric uh, America that did exist. And I think it's a difficult time for us to take cohesive action on things because of these large uh, populations that come from elsewhere. Well, you know, we've had a great difficulty because of the um, of having a declaration on the Armenian genocide just because of the large number of Turks. We, we can't do this because of the large number of that. We do some things. We gave a preferential treatment to immigrants from Ireland because of the large number of Irish people in the political system and just the large number of people who trace their ancestry to Ireland. That is, I've always thought, and I thought this from almost the day I arrived in America in 1963, and that is, this is not a mixing bowl, much more of a fruit salad where each entity remains separate but cohesive to a certain extent with this upper level, which was people identifying largely with Britain, but at least with Europe and speaking English, and totally with European culture. I mean, most of us knew a lot about European culture. We read European books, plays, and admired it. I mean, we took basically the culture that was founded on the Mediterranean and adopted it as our own. Today we have Chinese, we have um, we have Japanese people who are not easy easily able to identify with that culture. So that's where you are. You're onto something, but I don't think it's worse at the moment than it was ten years ago, or it might be in ten years to come. Well, but think, we, we yeah. will see the strain, and we're seeing it now. That, that uh, may... Yeah, I do agree. I would just say that I thought Black Americans were more American than anyone after 400 years of being here and had no identification, although, you know, with the continent of Africa, they knew nothing about it. No, but they, they had with uh, Black Blackness. But I also yeah. think that, you're right, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants ran the country, <laughs> and, 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 and but the contributions in terms of the voice, that's political voice, right? But if you look, if you look at the business stuff, it was the immigrants who became the wealthy and the business people also, whether they were. That happens everywhere. Yeah, that uh, happens everywhere. And it's worth right. looking at. The reason it happens is they're not, there's no legacy. There's no snobbery. Not and they take the, the problems. Social to them. structures, yeah. Right. You let me. We should let, let, you would think we should let Andre say something. Or we well, we, I think we need to vote on it. Let me. Let me. Let me. You're going to lose the audience if you guys don't change topic. Uh, <laughs> it's boring. Uh, what? So, I'm sorry. Did you hear that, Andreas? 
So, so look, I want to I want to review the executive order from President Biden that was issued yesterday. Uh, this is the morning brew uh, rendition of that. President Biden issued an executive order on AI that is a comp as comprehensive as a typical that steakhouse order, the first of its kind federal action aims to regulate an industry that has been mostly left to its own devices. Biggest consequences, the developers of future advanced AI models will have to submit safety test results to Uncle Sam to prove that they're not a public threat. So how is that going to work out? Well, apparently the National Institute for Standards and Technology will set benchmarks for safety testing. Uh, that would be interesting on its own, which the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Energy will use to evaluate risks to national security and infrastructure. The Department of Commerce will issue directions for watermarking AI-made content so you can know if that, if that Harry and Meghan divorce announcement is a deep fake. The Department of Labor and the National Economic Council will study ways to mitigate the effects of AI on jobs. The Department of Justice will get extra training and tech assistance to investigate cases of AI algorithmic bias. Landlords, federal benefit programs, and government contractors will receive guidance to ensure that they are using AI equitably. What else? The White House will develop guidelines for federal agencies to strengthen AI privacy protection practices. But Biden said that it is up to Congress to pass consumer privacy rules for the industry. The order also claims to standardize the government's use of AI by streamlining the process for federal agencies to buy AI tools and hire experts. And it provides resources for small developers and researchers in an attempt to prevent a handful of corporate behemoths, Microsoft, Google, Apple, and the like, from dominating the industry. But, says the last paragraph, the order is only a starting point, establishes important norms. It consists primarily of recommendations and contains some guidance that isn't enforceable by the executive branch, making it unclear how effective it will be in practice. And of course, it has little power over international AI developers. John Butler, what say you? Well, you know, I've always said the following. When an industry is highly intellectual, when the industry depends on the best and the brightest, and in case this does. And let me just let me just say what I think what a uh, machine learning or AI actually is. So it's computer science combined with statistics, and that allows us to predict, right? That allows uh, a machine to say, is this uh, is it X or Y? If it is, then it's it's one point of kind of predictive. It's not regular regression; it's logic regression, and then and they're using. For, for for the machine to learn theories from uh, statistics and prediction from, from social psychology, psychology and sociology. But I've always said this, it is very, very hard in any kind of way to really, really regulate intellectual enterprises. We have moved from say the last great revolution in, in, uh, in manufacturing to a different kind of manufacturing. So Andreas, when you came along, what happened is we fed the computer stuff, right? And now what we do is, is, is now what is machine learning? The more data you have is learning. So you don't have to feed it anything. It's going to learn by itself. It can learn how to bounce a ball. It can learn how to drive a car. It can learn how to work. It can learn how to type. It can learn how to use a computer. But, the, but you got to understand it depends on feeding data because it is machine learning. With no data, the machine doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll say this. I'll say this. What we have to do is make sure that this Superman is on our side. Okay? Mm -hmm. So think of machine learning or AI as Superman. Superman, which was developed at Glenville High School, where my wife went to high school, would come to the rescue of individuals because he had different kind of powers. 
in AI, it has all kinds of information. So the machine learning can also learn how to kill. The machine learning can also learn how to rob. The machine learning can also learn how to crash airplanes. The machine learning can also learn how to crash cars. So what you want to regulate is something you cannot see mm -hmm. because it depends strictly on data. You got to remember, no data, no machine learning. Now, to the extent that the data are a reflection of us, then it is learning from us. But what kind of people are, is it learning from? Is it learning from people who are bad or learning from people who have great values? It's going to be very, very difficult to take the analog of a human being or machine learning where they can learn to do anything and regulate it. Now, right. it can be re regulated in terms of can it be applied to this industry? Can jobs be replaced? And I heard the president speak, and he said the following. President Biden said, we cannot make the same mistake that we made when we had the globalization of industry, where there were so many jobs lost. I think that there's nothing you can do, there's nothing you can do to regulate the inner working of the machine learning. Mm -hmm. The data we have, the more it learns. Pull away the data, it learns nothing. Okay, so it's not just sitting there because what it does, it looks at probability models. And so, so an automobile can see some people and then it looks at it and say, well, you know, what's the probability of this? It, run, it runs the analysis over and over and over when it learns that, well, this, this is a cat or this is a house or this is a person. So it's going to learn the more data that we put in it. So Andreas, here's the deal. Machine learning is a reflection of our data. It's learning on our data. And the question is, will it be Superman or will it be the analog of Superman? Right. Well, and King, what say you? I've heard it said that you've got to separate machine learning somewhat from AI. That is the, that is the feedstock machine learning. But uh, the, the daily operation, you're so absolutely right, John Sibley Butler. You might want to record that I said that separately. Um, you're so absolutely right that uh, data is the key to this. One of the reasons that Britain, which whether it's a, even as we are broadcasting a conference going on in digitally, which is a mansion outside of London, famous for its code breaking during the or for housing the code breaking staff during the Second World War. But one of the things that make you Britain a, a, a leg up, uh, although the amount of money going into British AI is much, much less than it has in America when billions of dollars are pouring in, um, and that is that they have so much National Health Service data there is data that is, nobody knew what to do with it. Everybody has been to the doctor since 1948, has somehow been put into computers and nobody knew what to do with it. Well, suddenly this becomes an unbelievable resource in medical research and everything else, and just in the mechanics of AI, how it will handle that much data as it is fed into the system. It is fascinating. AI is fascinating. AI is such an advantage for research of all kinds. For example, you're building a building and it turns out to be unstable. This has happened in New York, but AI was not around at the time. Well, you've got uh, uh, a huge building going many stories into the sky and you find there's an instability at the bottom. They, they fixed it and I think it was on 58th Street and I wouldn't swear to that. They fixed it with a uh, by putting a brace and some other things so that uh, there was a situation where if the wind came from a certain direction, there was instability. Well, now you will ask AI what to do, and it will come back and say, oh, well, in Singapore, in such a day, this happened. You should try that. Or it will do the calculations. It will itself do the calculations, the stress calculations, and recommend a course of action to avoid the instability. <clears throat> that is extraordinary. Its ability in healthcare is limitless. Uh, I know one AI researcher 
He is uh, writing a book. He works for NASA. He's the lead in NASA AI. Um, and he says that children born today can expect to live to 120 years of age because of the advances there will be in medical science, uh, in compounds, in the ability, and just simply uh, sometimes bringing together known things. But the downsides are that he does subtract jobs. Uh, the, uh, you know, when you go up to the McDonald's and talk to the machine outside out of your car window, you'll now be talking to AI. There'll not be a, a student on the other end. That kind of thing. Immediate subtraction of jobs at the lower end. And then in the white collar jobs, people who deal with the public are going to go. When you have a problem with your insurance company and you are put on hold for half an hour as you punch different things into the telephone, um, that's gone. You will be talking to what sounds like a person, very helpful, all sorts of suggestions, who you get through to immediately, but you're talking to a bot. The problem is the person you might have been talking to otherwise is out of work. The person might have been in India serving America, but they're out of work. Um, uh, um, Goldman Sachs has calculated that AI in a very short time will take away globally 300,000 jobs. So those are the two sides. We don't know. What the president has done is he's issued an executive order. Executive orders are more declarations than they are implementations because they don't have the force of law behind them. One of the disturbing developments very recently it's been while everybody talked about AI as being open source and, and uh, everybody can know what's going on. Uh, in fact, the companies, and there are a lot of them, I have a table somewhere, but not to hand, and I don't know how to put it on the computer anyway. But uh, I have a table that shows all the companies offering AI services. They're huge, uh, and they are as quickly as possible becoming very secretive about what they're doing, how they're doing it. Uh, so the, the glorious moment when we thought it would all be open source, when we thought there would be transparency, that everything has gone. Uh, clearly, the government understands this, but you can't fix it with an executive order. Although I do applaud the Biden administration for at least taking hold of this in some measure. Uh, and we, we don't know where it all ends. We have the problem that we may have in, in Europe where they will try to regulate too early, regulate without understanding what they're regulating, and we'll have a disaster. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a bumpy road ahead, and we've just got to recognize that. This may be, and other people have said this, as big an event as the invention of printing or the steam engine and those things, as you know, change everything. Well, you know, I'm showing now um, from Soul Machines, uh, you can actually uh, build your own uh, digital person in minutes. This is, this is, I understand, Megan that we're looking at, and she looks pretty real. And they can leverage uh, everything about the AI and the GPT and all that stuff. And so, so the question, the question is, John. Um, I mean, how do how do we go about testing or regulating that the AI that we're building is good and not evil? How how do what, what kind of tests are we talking about? Well, let's look at at the first thing that we can do. I have I have a, I have a friend with the uh, Southern University, and they are redoing all the museums in America. And instead of reading a something, you know, a, a plaque under George Wallace's, George, George Wallace's, I meant George Wallace of, uh, of of Alabama, then you can just let him talk to you and say, well, what happened in, in Birmingham? Mm -hmm. If you look at the museum in, in Washington, D.C., then you can have uh, President Lincoln just to talk to you uh, with 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 books now, as as Lou Ellen well knows, uh, the books also will be smart, so you'll be able to ask a book. Uh, give me a history lesson from seventeen eighty six. So the good part, as as Lou Ellen would say, there's so much data, and what it does is bring those data to your fingertips almost instantly. 
and that's what's so amazing on on the uh, on the learning side. On the regulation side, it's going to be like regulating anything. If it is very very harmful, you know, we had the same thing with television. How many debates have we had about the impact of television on the moral standards of America? How many debates have we had about what should not be on TV? And then, of course, I'm amazed at people who want to burn books in America now because nobody reads books anymore. <laughs> they just go to the digital part and do what? And get what they want. So I think the regulation is going to be around specific industries. And the regulation is going to be around those things that could really, really harm people. Not just a loss of job. That would be a big one. But I don't think you can do anything about that in a in a uh, in a society where people make decisions on how to reduce the uh, the investments to reduce the cost for investors. Okay, so if you look at the AI stock now, I'm sure that it's going right out right out of the right out of the, right right out of the uh, right out. Of the so therefore, it's important to understand that we will be concerned about job loss, but I don't think you can regulate that based on just like the car industry when they replaced uh, people with uh, robotics. But here's the deal, Andreas. When it begins to harm people, okay, and I'm not just talking about morally, which they talked about with school books and, and everything like that. I'm talking about things that go in, take people's homes, pretend to be you, a speaker for you in your voice, I might add, mm -hmm. that you're going to have to reimagine the entire police force. So as Llewellyn said, I mean, what the president said is very, very interesting. But to me, it is void of any kind of, of regulation because to regulate AI, you have to be AI. Hmm. It's very interesting. I have posited to people, and I haven't uh, gotten a good answer. Uh, is it possible for AI to introduce its own policing, to have its own police force? And I don't see why not. But I want to tell you, uh, I've been asked and I have completed the um, preface to a book on AI, a very studious book. I'm not sure that I belong in it at all. But the great point which this book makes and which I have tried to make in the preface, I'm not going to mention it but the name because I'm not sure if I'm authorized to do that, but it's going to make a big splash when it comes out, this book. Um, and that is that AI is exponential and we are approaching it in a linear way. And the, the, the you know, as, as um, I said this somewhere else, but as, as George, as um, Jack Welch said when he was running GE, if the rate of change outside is faster than the rate of change inside, the end is known. If you're being exponential inside, outside, and it's linear inside, you're not going to get to a good place. The problem with government regulation is it has to be linear. It has to be based on what is known, not what might happen. So it's a very... The idea is that rather than regulate, there should be guidelines, uh, indications of what is a sound way to proceed. Uh, I would mention, uh, if I might, Andres, that one of the problems we're seeing in AI is the degree to which the data on which it is operating is biased. Uh, I've seen various examples. Ask for an honest person and you'll get a white person. Ask for a criminal and you'll get somebody else. Um, uh, probably somebody from Venezuela, Andres. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, this is the very beginning. We haven't got a clue what we've got here. We've mm -hmm. got a lump of ice that you could put in a cocktail body, which has been chipped off an iceberg. We don't know. So well, we've let me got just to say try this and think exponentially. We've got to try to get our arms or our minds around the idea that yesterday is gone and today has arrived and it's going to be vastly different in ways we have not heretofore uh, contemplated. But I would add, there is a solution. Cut off the electricity <laughs> and AI is done. Unfortunately, we need the electricity. Well, let me ask you this, uh, Llewellyn. In terms of the police, we have our hands full now with people hacking into our old time computer system. 
we have our hands full time now with the exposure of data already. What does AI do to that? Can we I... AI police that? Uh, can it, there be a bad AI that goes through and do the things that that the mass man would never do? Right. So my well, question is, how how do we take that? And look, I, I mean, AI is here. I mean, what we are presented with exposure of credit cards already. Can AI solve that problem? It, it I think it can solve some problems that we don't think it can. Remember, AI can write its own code, which is truly frightening, because then you get off into developments. It doesn't mean it has to think or have a plan for global global conquest. It may become a global factor if it is not already and change things. But we don't know. We can't. We can do our best to project, but we've got to be open minded about it, and we've got to try to avoid using yesterday's solutions. Um, uh, uh, intellectual property is a threat. Uh, the veracity of written words is a threat. The veracity of anything to do with what with a professor at, at uh, the University of California, uh, Stuart Russell calls, told me when I interviewed him, language in, language out. That's journalism, the law, teaching, just those areas suddenly you cannot verify you do not know the provenance of the material you're dealing with and that's very challenging and difficult so would this drive us back to the individual person then so what i hear you saying is this is that there is so much data we won't know what's good or what's bad would that drive us back to telephones no i didn't say that i didn't say that so I'm a, I'm a professor, and I've got students all over the world. I got students at Ivy League schools and etc. When they got jobs, you could write a letter, but they wanted to talk to you. They said, "Okay, we got your letter on X, Y, and Z, but really tell me about X, Y, and Z." So, do Ellen, Lou Ellen, do you think the abundance of data, if you will, would drive us back to me calling you and saying the following: I have all the information that that happens. Did a journalist really write this? That you really and then you've got to be sure that the voice, that this is not your <laughs> voice speaking from a bot. I told a lawyer who asked me, to, I was on their webinar about this, one of the, actually the largest law firm in the world, Denton's. I was on their webinar on this subject, and I said, if you want to be certain going forward, get a typewriter, type things, tie a piece of pink ribbon around it and send it by United Parcel Service. That way, there will be no doubt about what it is and its authenticity. Uh, it's a new world and we don't know. We so, are so, inclined but, but, as people to make silent movies when the- I think the lawyers will really be affected. I think- but, lawyers... but let's look at something, but let's look at it differently for a moment here. So so if the internet was the democratization of the access to information, just the access to information, with AI, GPT, and what's coming next, it is the access to knowledge. So any job blow that doesn't have a, a million dollars to hire the best lawyers, the best- financial advisors, the best whatever, has access to all that knowledge now from making, from making anything to making any decisions about any complexity. Isn't that wonderful that every human in the planet with access to the internet can now have access to all the knowledge that only the elite have always had? Well, the question is, who, who will you sue? So therefore, when I, when I get sick and I go online and say, What's good for this? And then I go to uh, Whole Foods and buy something. And then that's and, and the decision that I make is bad. The question is, who's responsible for the product now, Andreas? So therefore, who can you sue? Who's responsible, uh, who's yeah, responsible I mean, for making sure that products are great? As Llewellyn would say, is this thing really good? So right now, AI could, could, could create its own formula, put it in a bottle, and ship it to you. <laughs> Theoretically, right? So and theoretically, that's true. It also, also means some structure around that information in, a, in our kind of society. And our kind of society is based on this. Whatever products you have, whatever information you have, if it hurts you, if it takes your character out, then you can sue. 
Sure. So you won't solution? be able to sue AI. And that Andres is right about uh, our access to things that were no longer available to us. And this is not confined. I, I like to think of it in terms of engineering, because it's too easy to plunge into in, into the, the soft world of ideas. But if you're building something, supposing you're building your own house, and you get them to a problem, how to close the roof. Supposing you've got a circular room and you can't close the roof at the top. I know about this because I come from Africa and it's a problem people who don't know what they're doing have with this closing the circular roof at the top. And well, you can go to AI and they will say, well, you can buy this kind of conical thing that will fit on it, or you can take thatch and you can bend it this way and this way, or you can put a piece of canvas here, but probably you would be best advised to seal it with tar and then put some uh, other properties into it. That kind of answer, the kind of answer that you want when you've got a problem, you will get very easily. Uh, it may not be the answer you wanted because you might not have this material, but then you will say, I don't have a titanium shield, for God's sake. Well, I Ellen. only have straw and tar paper. And it will come back and tell you how to do the same job with straw and tar paper, I assume. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting. Uh, for example, in architecture, we always think of architects as building wonderful structures. Most architects are worrying about how to get the wet stack out of the building and the elevator up without tape. AI will do that for you, except that the architect may not be able to sell his services to anyone. anymore. <laughs> so, Alan, right now, right now, I play classic guitar already. I'm, walk, I'm working on some handle and Bach pieces. I could go to YouTube, which I've done. I don't have to pay the 60 bucks an hour to my classic guitar teacher that I used to have. I could go to YouTube. Not only can I listen to it, but they can tell me how to play it. So that's happening right now to an extent. What AI would do, it would bring all of that knowledge on how to play the hand of peace saddle bond that I'm working on. And we'll be much more, as, as, as Andrea said, we go from information uh, to knowledge. So in the real sense, when when you have when your when your commode breaks down, people go to right now. They go to the to, to YouTube and say, "How do I fix this?" Mm -hmm. As you would say, what's frightening is that knowledge will increase significantly, not only from YouTube, but from around the globe. All the problems that's been had, mm -hmm. and and therefore, if you go through every professions, as as, as you would say, if it has to do with the movement of, of knowledge, if it has to do with words. If we go through every profession as, and, ask, and ask the following question, will we have uh, uh, reporters in the future? Well, uh, will we have uh, AI giving the news in the future? Uh, right. some, in fact, one of my students, they were doing that in Japan 10 years ago. Uh, will, will we have uh, AI, as we do now, telling us how to drive to Dallas? Uh, you know, So my way is, is, is AI. But the information would be so much more now. Sure, absolutely, and I and I think that that's really, uh, you know, while there there are some challenges about managing this next episode of evolution, that that th those the benefits of and, and the and think about it. I mean, when when the internet was created, nobody thought of Facebook or Twitter or all these other things, Instagram, what have you, right? And people are making money and doing all kinds of things in these platforms, right? I mean. Imagine now with AI everywhere on every phone, engaging the global planet, 7 billion people on phones with all the creativity of the world to solve any problem, to have access to any complex knowledge about anything. I mean, I, I you know, I think that the benefits outweigh the bad in a, in a significant way. And, and this is why it's going to happen and it must happen. I agree, Andreas, but remember, the opposite of the good is bad. Yeah. And even with the internet, the bad was a problem in terms of what we call hacking. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine now, a, a, I mean, because in addition to us sitting in front of the computer, I mean, there would be a, a Llewellyn King AI going around the world giving talks, giving speeches. Yeah. Yeah. He would not have to, to get on his, his airplane. He'll just jump out 
of the computer, just like Superman did in the movie, right? And he'll be there. So I think it's it's not a matter of of if it's helpful. The matter is how do you, how do you make sure that Superman does not have kryptonite? Yeah, you have to you to understand the enormity of this thing, or to try to understand the enormity. I don't think we can. Uh, think of why Hollywood has been on strike. You could, in theory, with AI, make a Tom Cruise movie with Tom Cruise, um, or something that looked like Tom Cruise, spoke like Tom Cruise, was in every way Tom Cruise, except it wasn't. And <laughs> a story not written by a writer, but written by AI, and all of this put together, that is why Hollywood has been on strike. Yes. These are very huge changes and big considerations. And when I say that it will subtract jobs, the people who, are, who argue with me about that, and they're legion, no question of that, is say, well, it never happened with automation. Well, automation couldn't make a movie starring Tom Cruise uh, without starting. And somebody mentioned in Japan, uh, you mentioned, Johnny, that they've been doing having automated news reading. In India now, you have, and on two stations I've read, uh, they have uh, bots reading the news and then turning to a live person and asking them a question. I mean, I can see, look at the smile on Andre's face. He won't have to have me anymore. He can have a bot. <laughs> I have to have you to argue with. Come on. But I, I've been so easy on you. I can see the end is in sight. The <laughs> bots are coming. <laughs> I love to have real Africans on. Oh. Well, you know, it's interesting that that uh, you said uh, in prima facie journalism is over, except that we need people who actually look at things with their eyes and tell us what they see, like war correspondents. Or diamonds, um, or diamonds. Um, you know. But um, not too much else is going to be immune. This is not, you know, I've said this before, but I, I repeat it. I think I've said it on this broadcast um, that we, we, when we got automation, we got automation and we produced an industrialized economy. Now we have a service economy and we're introducing AI into a service economy. And yeah. what is the best thing for AI to do? Service economy jobs. And, uh, you know, it behooves all of us to know this. And for governments or for thinkers, say, in universities, if we have any of those, um, that they should start thinking about this and starting in the intellectual debate uh, coming up with possible scenarios to deal with this potential large unemployment that may be coming down the pike at us. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a professor of computer science at a large university, I won't tell you which one, uh, but he said, oh, well, we'll just retrain them for a higher level. Well, not everybody can be retrained for a better job. Uh, they don't have the inter I can't. I'm not smart enough to be retrained to do anything other than what I do. Uh, and a lot of people who do very menial, simple things. My hope is what, what I think will work. If you need work, for God's sake, become a plumber because AI will not fix the leaking pipes. That's right. That's right. So, so look, I, I, I totally concur with everything you guys have said in, in looking at the time here. Uh, you know, I I personally think that that the benefit of uh, the the new computer you know e ecosystem propelled with AI, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for the digital divide to disappear because it is really difficult for the little guy, for the little city, the little county the little enterprise, the little taco stand to keep up and do all the things that the big company can do because the big company has people. And I don't have people. I have five employees. I have 10 employees. I know city managers that are running cities with 100,000 people and all they have is three guys running the whole place. You know, and 
And so how do you do social media and, and customer acquisition and marketing and, and online payment systems and all these things, right? And so AI is going to really be an equalizer for the little guy more than we ever thought possible. And it will be the creativity of that little guy that will actually bring the next Facebook and the next Amazon and on and on and on. And to me, that is, you know, exciting because it empowers uh, the imagination and the creativity of everyone uh, in, in, in an equal fashion, you know, and, and so it's no longer the elites running the show, but now it's going to be the ability and the creativity of anyone with the right tools and the right focus. And it will be for good primarily, but I'm sure it will be for bad as well. So just like the ransomware guys continue to make tens of billions of dollars preventing companies from accessing their data, some bad actors will emerge in AI that will prevent Llewellyn from being Llewellyn and flying everywhere with his own ID. But, you know, but in the end, I think that the innovation will outweigh the, the benefits of the innovation will outweigh the negatives. You know, I think that's a, that's an excellent analysis with the exception of this. We still have to have oversight. We still have to have people, people making decisions when things go wrong. Uh, and that's true. Also true for the computer is true, true for television. That is the debate about AI should continue. And as we continue that debate, you have to look at what the president said and ask, you know, how do you, how do you manage this? It's going to be the most difficult thing in the world to manage. Uh, and also remember that the reason why AI can write its own code is because it's drawing from the codes that we have written already. So mm -hmm. you got to realize that the creativity, I'll say it again, and the learning curve of AI is directly related to the data that it can pull and learn from. Mm -hmm. That's certainly, they tell me that the neural networks in AI, uh, which have lost control of, are capable of deduction. We know that. Yes. Um, they're, they're not capable of thinking the way we do, but they're capable of deduction. Uh, Absolutely. And, and where, where that goes, we don't know. None of this do we know. Uh, it is very good that we're talking about it because it's coming. I, uh, uh, Leon Trotsky, I've used this in speeches, said, uh, <clears throat> you may not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is interest in you, which Alan first, the writer, changed to you may not be interested in war, but war is interest in you. I say you may not be interested in AI, but AI is certainly interested in you. Oh yeah. And yeah, and as Machiavelli, as Machiavelli would say, the question is, how does it relate to the the knowledge of the real world? the knowledge of the universe. And once we get that knowledge, what do we do with that knowledge? Machiavelli would say, my prince, we can use this. <laughs> <laughs> or John Butler, we can use this. Well, very similar. Thank you, Ellen. I've been waiting for that for three years. AI. I've got to go. go. Always a pleasure. Johnny, take us away. Okay. The cruel war is raging. Johnny can't fight. I want to be with him from morning to night. I want to be with him. It breathes my heart so. Won't you let me go with you? Oh, my love, no. I'll tie back my hat. Clothing I'll put on, then I'll march as your comrade. As we march along, I'll march as your comrade. We go with you. No one.
Very well, Johnny. Very well. Thank you very much. We'll we'll stop recording now and sign off. And thank you, everyone.